<clears throat> it is questions and answers night, and so I've been looking forward to this one. I had a question turned in. I had three questions, and I ended up just sticking with one tonight, and we'll save the other ones for later. Uh, because this one I thought would take a little bit of time and uh, is worthy for us to look at. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, he tells us to be diligent, to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so God says, listen, I have given you the tools. You have a mind. You, can ha you, you have uh, self-control. You have intelligence. I want you to look into the word that I have given to you, and I want you to consider it. I want you to meditate on it, and I want you to do what it says. And so he tells us, go to the word, go to the Bible, understand what the will of the Lord is, and then put it to practice in your life. And that's what we're going to do, uh, considering Bible questions. And uh, again, as I told you all last week, uh, next year, I'm looking forward to our questions and answers time, and I'd encourage you to consider uh, uh, starting, go ahead and start asking friends and neighbors what their questions might be and let them know that on the first Sunday night of each month we'll be doing questions and answers here and it'll be their questions and uh, we'll look into the Bible and have a Bible answer for the questions that anybody might have for us because it's not really uh, our opinion it doesn't matter what I think about something really all that matters is what God says about it and so we'll look into the Word of God and find the answers to the questions that we have so tonight the question that uh, we're going to cover is what's a Christian response to radical Islamic terrorism? Radical Islamic terror. You knew eventually we were going to have to talk about it at church, right? <clears throat> it's, uh, it, it's ridiculous, the uh, situation that we find ourselves in, I believe, here in the United States. Uh, but we are here in this situation. Did you know since uh, September 11th, 2001, Muslims have carried out 27,391 attacks worldwide? That's just since 2001, September. But since 1972, uh, there have been 3,110 killed by Muslims in the United States of America. And there were 82 terror attacks that resulted in that 3,110 uh, deaths. <clears throat> Some of those weren't just uh, uh, attacks on other people. Some of those that are counted in that are Islam-related honor killings, where they believe that they should murder a member of their family because they don't do things exactly the way they think they should do them. I had an experience in uh, teaching some uh, young women who had been brought up in Iran when I was younger. We uh, were actually at the church building and uh, doing a car wash, car washing cars for members, and uh, the phone rang, and some of the girls happened to be inside, and they came out, and they said, hey, there's some people on the phone who want to talk to a minister. And I said, well, okay. And so I went inside and, and uh, listened to what the person had to say. They said they wanted to become a Christian, and they needed me to tell them what we believed it took to become a Christian. And I, I thought, well, this is kind of a joke phone call. You know, this is a prank call. And, uh, but I, I started going through the plan of salvation, explaining, you know, you've got to hear the Word of God, and if you believe that Word, then you uh, repent of your sins, you confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and you're immersed for the forgiveness of your sins. I gave them the scriptures that we usually go through and that we consider, you know, we look at them every single uh, sermon and, and consider those things. And, and as I got through with my explanation of what it takes to become a Christian, the response from the other side of the line was, that's exactly right. Will you be there for the next 30 minutes? Because we're coming and we want you to baptize us. And I said, well, sure, that would be great. But I'd like to talk to you a little bit more maybe before we get to that, because I don't know anything about you. And they said, we'll be there in 30 minutes. And they were. It was two sisters. They were raised in Iraq, I mean in Iran. And uh, <clears throat> they came. We studied just a little bit more. They obeyed the gospel. Uh, they're still faithful members at the congregation. Now, there was a time, about three months later, that their mother came from Iran and stayed with them. And one of the Sundays that, while that was going on, one of those Sundays we had a fellowship meal. And they had been looking forward to preparing us some traditional dishes uh, during that fellowship meal. And they called Leanne and I, and they asked if we would meet them at a... Uh, at a gas station to get the dishes that they had prepared because they wouldn't be able to come to church while their mother was there. And, you know, I didn't really understand a whole lot about it at that time. But the more I researched it, I realized 
the fact of these honor killings, the fact that if one were to leave what their family believes to be right, uh, then they are uh, instantly uh, ready and, and able then under their laws to kill that person. And uh, these girls were scared for their lives from their own families. When the mother went back to Iran, they had started attending church services again. And uh, so these, these girls lived in, in terror of their own families based on the teachings that they find in the Quran. I'll cite one of the scriptures from the Quran. It's in Surah 9, and it's verse 123. It says, O ye who believe, fight those of the disbelievers who are near to you, and let them find harshness in you, and know that Allah is with those who keep their duty. This is a command in the Quran. Something that uh, a Muslim, not a radical Muslim, not an extremist Muslim, but a true Muslim would honor and would keep. In fact, the ones that we have in the United States that are not carrying out terrorist attacks, those would be considered very liberal Muslims, if, if that can be a word. Those are ones who aren't doing it right. Because if they were doing it right, they would be carrying out the commands of their book that they consider just as authoritative as we recognize the true Word of God is, the Bible. <clears throat> so, I say those things to just recognize that this is a worthy question for us to address here at church. I know that it's in the news a lot, uh, but the fact is sometimes there are uh, social issues that really didn't begin as social issues. These are really scriptural, biblical issues that need to be addressed. And so we're going to uh, look at this tonight. We're not uh, doing a, an examination of, uh, of Islam tonight. The question is, what's a Christian response to radical Islamic terrorism? And again, I would say it's not radical Islamic terrorism. This is just Islamic terror. This is what they're com com commanded to do from their, their book. So our response. First, I would remind you the fact that violence in our world really doesn't even start to compare with the violence in the world throughout the times recorded in Scripture. There in Hebrews chapter 11, if you'll go down to verse 32, just think about the persecution, the violence that the people, uh, the, the, the early, the Jews uh, through the Old Testament, but then also the early Christians and what they suffered through as they lived their lives. Hebrews eleven thirty-two 32 says, What more shall I say? Time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became vigilant, uh, valiant in battle, and turned to fly at the armies of aliens. Women received their dead to life again. This is referencing, of course, many stories that we recognize from the Old Testament, that these uh, wonderful, uh, faithful Jewish people who were part of God's promised people, uh, what they lived through. And then notice, he starts again in the second half of verse 35, and here he notices not only things that may have happened to those in the Old Testament that we don't necessarily read specific stories about, but we know historically that these things happened to Christians in the early church. It says, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourging, yes, of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. See, Christians have always been persecuted. People of God has all, have always been persecuted. There's always been those who would want to war against those who try to serve the God of creation, the true God and creator of mankind. It's always gone on. So, what do I do? What do you do as Christians? Our response should be the same as what God's response has all, God's people's response have always been. First, prayer. Now, I know that in our country here this week, we've had uh, public servants who have uh, railed against prayer, who have said, well, prayer's not enough. And I recognize there needs to be some action also, but I think the natural response of any person of faith should always first be 
to turn to God in prayer. When we have questions, just as we're doing tonight, the first response we have is to turn to His Word. Listen to what God has to say about the subject. Make sure we're in line with what, is, what God is teaching and then putting it to practice in our life. And so our first response, as taught through the Word, when we face any adversity, is prayer. That we would pray to God, that we would look to God and recognize He's the one who directs the affairs of men. He's the one who's in charge. And and recognizing also that our prayers can affect change. There in Romans 13, it tells us in verse 1, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. He says, I've put these things in place. Now, we don't always understand God's methods. We don't always understand what God's doing. We don't always understand when we see things rise up and things uh, come crumbling down. We don't understand God's overall plan that's happening all the time when we see it. In fact, we're bewildered sometimes when we think, well, this looks terrible. This looks like something bad, like like we're not going to be able to overcome this. But the fact is God knows more than we know. And sometimes uh, to uh, bring a people down to earth to, to help people realize who they really are and who they really belong to is a way that God straightens out some problems. If you'll think about it, in Butch's class this morning, we, we mentioned the fact that in, history, in the history of the United States, when were the, the most righteous times of our history? Was it not during times of conflict? Was it not during time of pain and suffering and loss, the Great Depression, uh, the wars that we have experienced from our country? Th- these things are when the greatest number of people have turned to the Lord, when they go through bad times. And so we recognize sometimes uh, God is directing these things. God is above the authorities, and He's helping us to come to our knees and to submit to Him because He tells us every knee will confess. Every tongue will confess, every knee will bow, everyone will turn to God. It's just some won't turn until it's too late. Some won't turn until they're standing before the judgment throne of God. But we, we have the opportunity to turn to Him while we still have life. <clears throat> so your prayers, they should affect change. In James five sixteen, it says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. He says your prayers work. There's something about when a righteous person turns to God. There is something special in a prayer when a person turns to God and makes a request of him out of a pure heart. It says Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain. And the earth produced its fruit. He says, your prayers have as much power as Elijah's. This great man of God, this great prophet of God who who performed amazing miracles, who did amazing things. He says, listen, you still have the ability to pray. And when you pray, that prayer still has the ability to affect change. And so we should pray. We should go to our knees and we should pray that God would handle these situations. We should, just as we already have tonight, pray for those families who have been affected. Pray for those who are suffering at this time. Go to God and lift them up. We should pray for the Christians who are close in vicinity to those who are suffering, that they would have the opportunity to minister, and that they might bring the word of life into that person's life, that they then might have hope in Jesus Christ. We should pray, and we should keep on praying. Not only that, Jesus tells us something in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43. Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. Now, this is a strong statement from the Lord, isn't it? It's one that's very hard for us to understand. It's one that doesn't come naturally to us because when we see on television people uh, uh, cursing our, our country, when we see them burning our flag, when you see them celebrating at the death of Americans, when you see them doing the things that they do because they hate who we are, something in us says fight back, right? Right? Something in us wants revenge even. 
Something in us rises up and, and doesn't want them to be able to continue doing these things to others. Now, some of that is righteous indignation, and, and that's understandable. Some of that is recognizing what's right and what's wrong and wanting what's right. Some of that. Some of that, though, is carnal. Some of that is a, is a, a part of our nature that says, I want what's best for me above anybody else. And the truth is what Jesus tells us here. You need to pray for them. Not only pray for them, love them. Recognize that they have a soul that was given to them by God. That they are also a child of God, born of his creation from him. That they also possess an eternal soul that will spend eternity either in heaven or in hell. And we recognize, based on what the Bible teaches, if they don't repent of their sin, that soul will spend eternity in hell in rebellion to the God who loves them and wants them to repent. It's a hard thing to pray for those who are the enemies, not only of our, of our great country, but also of our great faith, because that's what they have described themselves as. And we need to recognize this is happening, but also keep in our hearts the teaching of Jesus Christ. We should pray for them. We should pray for their repentance. We should pray for them to have an understanding. We should pray for those uh, who are, are missionaries who are teaching the gospel in those Middle Eastern countries. We should pray for them fervently. We should find a way to support them and make sure because really the path to change, the path to uh, destruction for the false teachings and the, the terrorizing ideas of Islam is through Jesus Christ. It's only through the knowledge of Jesus that will end the violence. It's only through the knowledge of Jesus Christ that hearts will be changed and that lives will be turned back towards their God. You know, those girls who we studied with and, and who obeyed the gospel, it really didn't take a whole lot of studying. They, they had studied for themselves. When they got to the building, they brought their Bible. They had a Bible. And, and when I turned the pages of their Bible, it was completely just marked with highlighters and little notes. And they had put things together. And you know what they told me? They told me the reason they asked those questions when I first got on the phone, the reason they asked those questions was because they had already talked to a lot of other churches, a lot of other preachers throughout the city of Atlanta. They had been calling around uh, for a long time, for months, and they would ask, what does it take to become a Christian? They already knew what it took to become a Christian because they'd studied their Bible. They were just waiting for a preacher to tell them the truth. That's what they were waiting for because they already knew the truth because they had a Bible and they studied it and they were determined to become Christians and only Christians, not something plus a Christian or, or, or Christian minus something, but just a Christian, a New Testament Christian following the example and the pure word of God that they might be exactly what we read about in the Bible. That's what they were waiting for. And they said, when you told us to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, we recognized that's exactly what those people in the book of Acts did. We knew what you were saying was what we already knew needed to be done. And so that's why we said, that's right, when you gave us that answer. Because we already knew that that was the correct answer based on what we'd read in the Bible. They hadn't listened to any other preachers. They hadn't listened to any other teachings. They had just listened to the Word of God. And then when they finally heard someone tell them what they knew the Word of God said, then they couldn't wait any longer, a moment longer. They immediately responded to the gospel of Christ and were immersed for the remission of their sins. So we should pray. We should pray that more Bibles would make their way into the hands of honest people who will read it and allow it to have the fruit that it teaches us it will have if people will read it with an open heart and understand the will of the Lord for their lives. So first, our response as Christians should be to pray. Pray not only for the victims, not only for those who are hurt, but pray for those who have made themselves enemies of the truth. Secondly, we should serve. We should serve those who are persecuted because they need Christians to show them compassion. You know, it's by our love that the world will know. When they see the love, when they feel that love, when they recognize who the help is coming from, then they see the connection. And then they start to understand, I need to know more about why these people are doing what they're doing. When they see the love, it will help. Now, it's not going to help every one of them. It's not going to change everybody's heart, but there's going to be some it will. 
It's never been the fact that, that multitudes and majorities of people turn to Christ. It's never been that way. It's always been a smaller number who recognize what's happening, who see the truth for what it really is, and they turn, okay? That's the way it's always been. It wasn't long that we, uh, many of us, I'm sure, saw on the news how that uh, there were boxes of, of relief supplies that were sent from the United States to those uh, refugees over in uh, Europe and different countries. And as they were walking up, we had uh, boxed those things up. Americans, I say we, the Americans had sent these over there. And they were in boxes with a red cross on the box. And those boxes were refused. But in the video, as you watch it, if you see the documentary on this, uh, they have several who are saying, please give it to me. You know, and they're stopped by those who are refusing it because it has a red cross on it. All right? There's always going to be a few who do seek what's good, who do recognize that there is help coming and who the help's coming from. So let's keep on serving them. Let's do what we can to meet the needs of their hearts. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God of, and uh, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may then be able to comfort those who are in any tri trouble with the comfort that we've received from God. For as the suffering of Christ abound in us, so our consolation abounds through Christ. Now if we're afflicted, it's for your consolation. It's for your salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. If we're comforted, it's also for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. We need to serve because we've been served. We had someone who thought enough of us to share the gospel with us. We had someone who, who set up before us a way to walk, who modeled before us Christian behavior that we would know how to then go and do what's right. So not only should we pray, we should also go to work, go serve, find a way to share the love of God. And that's the last point I would make is be love and be light to a dark world. In Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 9, Romans 12, verse 9, says there, Let love be without hypocrisy. Now, as we read this, I, I want you to think about what we're talking about, about terrorism, about the things that are going on in our country and how those uh, who would like to take the lives of those who want to do what is right and instead exchange what's right for what's wrong. Think about those people as you read what the Holy Spirit tells us here. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Now listen, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves but rather give place to wrath for it is written vengeance is mine i will repay says the lord therefore if your enemy is hungry feed him if your enemy is thirsty give him a drink for in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his head don't be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good what amazing instructions from a holy god who expects a holy people to react and respond to adversity, even terrorism, with the same heart that he has reacted to us. With the same heart and the same mindset that he has looked upon our sin and forgiven us. God's calling us to be light and to be love in a dark world. Now, knowing these things, I want to point out one other thing. <clears throat> The fact is, it is not your responsibility to be a victim. 
there are some who would say, well, uh, you know, uh, those Christians in the first century, they, they just ran. You know, they, they were scattered abroad, and that's how the church spread, was because they were scared and they ran for their lives. And, and that's what we should do. No, you're not commanded by Scripture to, to run and hide. You're not commanded by Scripture to, to uh, uh, just allow someone to take your life. In fact, you're commanded the exact opposite. You are to preserve life. That's what the Scriptures teach. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he tells us, Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. Your body doesn't belong to you. You don't get to choose when your body dies. You don't get to choose to take this life, to let this life go. You don't make that choice. That is in the hand of God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That's not your decision. That's God's. And you must preserve life. It teaches that our bodies are not our own. Our bodies belong to God. Our bodies are His property, and we aren't permitted to treat them or to destroy them as we please. Not only are we to take care of our bodies and the life that's contained in our bodies, the spirit that's contained in our bodies, but we have an obligation to preserve the life and the body of other people. In Psalm 82 and verse 4, it says, Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. You free them from the hand of the wicked. Proverbs 24, 11, Deliver those who are drawn towards death. Hold back those stumbling toward the slaughter. You hear that? Preserve life, Christian. Can't help but think of 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8. If anyone does not provide for his own family, especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and he's worse than an unbeliever. You won't be worse than an unbeliever? Then don't take care of yourself. Don't stand up for your family. Don't protect them. The fact is, those Christians in the first century, they had no choice. They had no way to protect themselves. They could do nothing to stop the onslaught of violence that came into their lives through the Roman government and through other means, but you do. You have a different path, so you need to be prepared to protect yourself. We're not looking for a fight, and we're not to be eager to have a fight. We're not to be eager to hurt anyone else. In fact, just the opposite. We're to pray and to hope and to work towards their, 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 their conversion into just as we are a follower of God. But we're not to just lay ourselves out there as some kind of sacrifice. That's not scriptural. That's not biblical. We are authorized to defend ourselves. And we're authorized to defend others should we become the target of an attack. You know, after issuing the command, thou shalt not kill, Jehovah immediately then commanded Israel to kill those who violated that statute not to kill. Think about that. God said, thou shalt not kill. And if somebody does kill, y'all kill them back. That's what he said. He makes it really clear. Exodus 20, 13, thou shalt not murder. Exodus 21, 12, he who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. This is God's command. You see, the fact is there's killing that is wrong, and that would be murder. Killing that is not authorized by God, not according to his will. But there's also killing that is right, authorized by God according to his will self-defense trying to preserve the life of others that they might then have hope of heaven you see while all murder involves killing not all killing is murder there is a place for us to protect ourselves we were just looking at romans chapter 13 and verse 1 and how god has set the authorities where they are notice verse 2 and following therefore whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of god and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves for rulers are not a terror to good works but to evil do you want to be unafraid of the authority do what's good and you will have praise from the same for he is god's minister to you for good but if you do evil be afraid for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is, a min is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. You know, Jesus himself, he told his followers to sell their cloak and go buy a sword. He told them, go sell your cloak in Luke 22 and verse 36. 
He said, listen, if you don't have a sword, you need to sell your cloak. You need to sell uh, this, this coat that keeps you warm at night when you're sleeping outside on the ground. This very important, vital piece of equipment that you have, you need to get rid of it because there's something more vital that you're going to need, a sword. That wasn't just for roasting marshmallows. It wasn't just to have something to, uh, shiny to look at. That was for protection. Jesus himself authorized his followers to carry protection, not only to carry it, but to use it to protect not only their lives, but the lives of any who they might be able to protect also. So the Christian response is absolutely to put our trust in God, not to be uh, tossed back and forth by the things that we hear in this world and the bad things that happen in this world, but to stay steady on course with God in prayer, in doing good and helping and doing what we can to serve our fellow man, but also in protecting not only ourselves, but others who need protection, who maybe can't protect themselves. I encourage you, don't allow it to get you down. Don't allow it to be something that, that keeps you from uh, doing the things that you should. In fact, use it as a motivation to realize that if we, those who are called to be good, those who are called to be righteous, aren't doing what's good and what's righteous, the fact is, and now more than ever in our lifetime, we see it, evil men will overcome. Evil will take over if good people don't do what they're supposed to. So let's do what we're supposed to. Let's serve and let's love and let's show a better way by holding up the word of life for others to see and others to hear that they might come to faith and then live according to God's plan also. Tonight, we want to encourage you uh, as we uh, consider questions and, and enjoy looking at what God has to say about how we should behave and how we should act in this world, especially uh, uh, with the current events that are happening, keep your faith in God. If you're a Christian and you've stumbled and you haven't done those things that you should, maybe you've not served or loved or, or been light in a dark world, just change. Start doing what you should. Start being righteousness for the sake of the gospel. And if you haven't obeyed the gospel, we want to encourage you to become a Christian. Make sure that you are a part of the family of God by obedience to his will. He's outlined it very clearly through the scriptures. If you've heard about Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection that he suffered for you, if you've understood what he did to save your soul, and that produces faith in your heart, and you want to go to heaven when this life is over, then he tells you, repent. Stop sinning. Stop walking in the ways of sin and start walking in the ways of righteousness according to his word. Confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God before others. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. So do that. And then continue to confess him by the way you live every day, showing others there's a higher purpose than just feeding your own belly and acquiring as much stuff as you can in this world. There's a higher purpose, and it's called heaven. It's eternity. Not only do you need to confess, but you need to be baptized. Be immersed for the forgiveness of, of your sins. Just as Christ died and was buried and he rose up the third day, he gives us a symbol that actually accomplishes that which it symbolizes. We die to ourselves in repentance. We're buried in baptism and we rise up out of that watery grave to walk a Christian life, a resurrected, changed person to live righteously in this world and to cause the effect that God wants in our lives and in this world to go throughout our lives then in faith that we might walk according to his way. If you need to do that tonight, we encourage you, obey the gospel. Whatever your need is, come while we stand and we sing.